Good morning, Life Story Church. What a festive, beautiful morning we have. I just love all the celebration in the air. Yes, the waving of the palm branches. I can only imagine some 2,000 years ago when Jesus was riding into Jerusalem on the donkey. The celebration, the excitement that it must have been. I want you to stand to your feet this morning, church. This is one of my favorite Sundays of just getting together with like-minded believers. We want to welcome those that are online. And if you haven't got a palm branch, we invite you to do so. We have our greeters at the back door. This is a celebration. We want to wave our palms. Just watch out for your neighbor. <laughs> but wave your palms. We're going to sing out this morning to the Ancient of Days. Come on, let's lift up his name. Blessing and honor, glory and power, be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days.
Hallelujah. Man, they say get on your horse and ride. I think this morning I'm getting on my donkey, though. Ugh, goodness. Uh, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. What a day to see him riding into Jerusalem, knowing the prophecy, understanding where this all is in time. They waved their palm branches and they shouted, Hosanna, save now. He is the only one worthy, amen?
Hosanna, King of kings and Lord of lords. Mm. Let's pray together this morning, church. Hosanna, King of kings, Lord of lords, Hosanna in the highest. We give you the highest praise this morning. Our hearts are filled with joy and gladness this morning, Jesus, as we are together singing your praises and lifting up your name, Yeshua, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah. You be praised, Hosanna in the highest to your name. There is none like you. We are here this morning with joy and gladness in our hearts, God, bringing you that praise. Father, we're celebrating this morning prophecy fulfilled some 2,000 years ago. But we know what you did, did then, Lord, excuse me, you'll do again. You fulfilled prophecies then, and there are those that are to come that we know you are going to fulfill right on time, just as you were that day when you rode into Jerusalem. You were right on time. You're right on time in our lives, God, every single day. Every single day we cry out to Hosanna. We give you praise this morning at Life Story Church. In Jesus' name, amen. I see the King of glory Coming on the clouds with fire The whole earth shakes The whole earth shakes Yeah
your praises, shouting, Hosanna, come save, save now. Lord, we lift up a shout to you as well this morning. We know you come to save us spiritually, Lord, for eternity, for our eternal soul. Not just from the oppression of man, as they, as many of them seem to think you were coming to, with a sword then, <laughs> but we know that you're coming with a sword of the spirit of truth, Lord to save us for eternity, something deeper. And Lord, we thank you. And Lord, we lift up your name this morning, the beginning of the Holy Week, in remembrance for what you have done and what you will do. So we sing Hosanna. fire you are our desire 
you have come to save us, Lord. You're the hope among us. You're the peace that binds us. You have come to save us, Lord. Oh, you have come to save us, Lord. Jesus, you're the one who saves us. You're the one who saves us. King of all the other kings on earth. Mm, Jesus, you're the one who you're the one who saves us, King of all the other kings on earth. You're the King of all peace and Lord of all light of the world you shine. You're the King of all kings and Lord of all He's the one who saves us. He's the only one who can save us. He's the only one that can save you. There's 
no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. In the name of Jesus. Now he's so good to us. He's loved you so much that he's chased you down. He's left the 99 for the one, and that one is you. The king of all kings. Think about that. King of the universe. King of the earth. And he cares so much about little you that he would leave it all for you. He left glory, church. He left glory to step down into human form to save you. And he's made it so it's available to all men. He's no respecters of persons, tribes. He would have it that none be lost. And so Palm Sunday, some 2,000 years ago, the people in Jerusalem came out and they laid their palm branches down. They threw their clothes down that he would walk across them on that donkey, that colt, foil of a colt. Oh, church, I pray today you celebrate his goodness. Celebrate your king this morning. Not just now, but all day and all week as we venture through Holy Week. Let's bow our hearts and our heads. Let's pray, church, and we'll invite our ushers forward. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for what you did. We thank you for what you continue to do, Lord. We know you've saved us for eternity. You've made a way. We've put our faith and trust in you. You've made that way. We know that if you can do that, you can do far things less. You can save us, Father, from circumstances. You can save us from addictions. You can save us, Jesus. You can mend broken hearts. You can mend broken families, Lord Jesus. You came to save us. We know you can save us completely, Lord Jesus. So we lift up our petitions to you now. We link arms as a body. Mending hearts together, Father, we bring these petitions to you, Lord Jesus. We speak Hosanna. Save us, save now. Salvation, Lord, we speak to the petitions that we bring before you, Lord. The requests that your people bring now with all their hearts, bring them, church. Lay them down at the foot of the, of the throne. We stand together in the throne room. Lord Jesus, have your way, have your way, Lord. Be it according to your will, we bring our prayer requests now, Lord Jesus. Lord, as we bring our tithes and offerings to you, Father, we do so with grateful hearts, hearts full of joy. We give not out of fear of condemnation, but out of a great joy of, the, of how you've blessed us, Lord, and how you let us be a part of this incredible thing you're doing in your church on earth, Lord, and in this community. We say thank you and amen as we give. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. to see every single one of you. You all look so wonderful this morning, all your smiling faces. You can't help it. There was a donkey outside. I'm still smiling. I was, that just made my whole day. <laughs> Thank you, Amber and Pastor Chad and anyone else who has helped make that possible. It's so fun. I love it so much. And 
what a beautiful, beautiful morning we have this morning. And just, just imagining that size, I think Bobby and I were talking about it, that being the size of the donkey, right? That's the one that we assume is the right one, right? The cross back. Right? Okay. It's small, but it just shows, you know, just the humbleness of our Savior, right? It's so beautiful, so beautiful. Well, welcome, welcome. This is Palm Sunday. We're so glad that you're here with us. If you are new, we'd love for you to fill out one of our connection cards. They're back there on the back table. If you don't mind filling one of those out and dropping it in that box, we'd love to keep you updated on everything going on here at Life Story Church through our weekly newsletter. Promise we won't spam you or hound you in any way, um, but we'd love to let you know what's going on so that you can get plugged in with us and connect and fellowship. Um, we also just want to reach out to you and see how you're doing. We love to do life with one another, and so that's a great way to great way for us to be able to contact you as well. And then question, comments, prayer requests. I know I mention this every once in a while. For those who have been with us, we still encourage you if you love, if you have any questions, comments, or anything, you, or prayer requests, praise reports, you can use that as well, and we'll be able to connect with you that way. And we also have our LifeStoryChurch.com website you can go to to find all the different social media media platforms we are a part of, and if you are a part of any of those, we encourage you to like, share, let people know what's going on. We know that's a, our realm of influence, being able, through a grass, as a grassroots church, being able to share that way is wonderful, so we encourage you to use those. Um, so a couple different things coming up. Of course, this is the beginning of Holy Week. This is Palm Sunday, praise the Lord, and we have our, this coming up Friday is Good Friday. This is our communion service we're going to have right here at the Rutledge West at 6.30 p.m. So we encourage you to come out to that um, and fellowship with us as we, as we remember what Jesus has done, the price he has paid. And we also have our Resurrection Sunday coming up. This is next Sunday. Uh, we are going to have, again, a beautiful, beautiful representation of the Lamb of God. We're going to have a baby lamb out there right as we did today starting at 9 30 9 30 to 10 30 we're going to have a lamb out there for the little ones to love on and you guys to love on take pictures with so we encourage you to come out again i loved being here early with you guys i don't know about y'all but that's just that little extra time of fellowship was wonderful and um, we're also going to have a photo booth set up we are trying to get a directory for life story church uh, back in action again so we encourage you guys to come out and if you'd like to get your picture made with your family or have that picture for the directory we encourage you to do that there um, and then we'll we'll get all that together at the end um, we also have the on um, the Sunday the 31st as well we have our missions giving Sunday for the sweet sleep foundation so prepare for that we also have a lot of information about that on our newsletter um, different things for you to watch different links and just be in prayer for this wonderful wonderful organization as they reach out to the orphan and the widow and everything that they do is so wonderful so we encourage you guys to uh, check that out and be in prayer on that as well. Um, the next thing we have coming up is our uh, women's ministry, our women's study. Um, we are connecting with one another again April 8th at 6.30 p.m. This is going to be at Teresa's house for this. It's going to be a like a spring social event where we're just going to get back together, love on one another, see how we're all doing, and get that kick started. And then we also have our men's breakfast on, the, on April the 13th, and that's at 9 a.m. at the City Limits Cafe, where you guys can fellowship and get together as well. And then, of course, not last but not least, we have our Wednesday night service as well, 6.30 p.m. right here at the Rutledge West. And our youth group meets downstairs in the underground um, for their fellowship and devotion time as well. And I think, nope, I'm not doing it. We're going to release the kids. <laughs> We're going to release the kids. May the Lord plant a seed in your heart that will reap an eternal reward. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, Diana. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see all of your lovely faces, familiar faces, new faces. We're so glad that you guys are here. This has got to be one of the, if not the most, festive Sundays of the year. I mean, Resurrection Sunday is pretty festive, but there aren't palm branches, right? So the, the, the palm branches just kind of bring everything up a notch, don't they? I remember when I was a kid, I always thought uh, palm, uh, palm Sunday was neat. Because I had two brothers, and I would just love to whip my brother with that <laughs> palm branch, you know. 
I'd get it back, don't get me wrong. You know, he, he could, he could uh, dish it back to me, that's for sure. Uh, that didn't mean to give any children any ideas. <laughs> But when I was a kid, Palm Sunday, uh, you know, that's pretty much what it was about. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, Palm Sunday, it was kind of a lesser known church holiday uh, it, the way I grew up, you know. Uh, all I, I knew about it was Jesus rode a donkey into Jerusalem, right? I mean, yeah, on, the, on the list of things that Jesus did, you know, he healed the sick, um, he rose from the grave, uh, he even flew right, at one point, you know, so riding a donkey wasn't really high on the list of cool things that he did, but uh, there's more to the story with Palm Sunday, and as a matter of fact, riding that donkey into Jerusalem was indeed, I think as we'll find out today, just about the coolest thing he could do, or one of them for sure. Uh, I'm, I've got a lot to get to today, and I don't want to leave anything uh, uh, leave anything on the table. So I want us to jump right into scripture today and see what we can find in regards to what is it I'm talking about uh, in regards to this, uh, this the, the uh, uh, coolness of riding a donkey into Jerusalem. Uh, I want to read from a few of the gospels this morning because uh, there's some really cool things that each gospel adds as we go. So we're going to begin in Luke chapter 19 today. So if you've got your Bibles, let those Bible pages flip. I love that sound. I can see them. I can hear them. I always love to say there's, no, there's not a more peaceful sound in the world than when your Bible pages are flipping. Because there's so much peace that comes from studying the Word. But in Luke chapter 19, verse 28 through 40, let's just take that. When he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. A little context here. Uh, earlier uh, during, Jerusalem, uh, during Jesus' ministry, uh, there was a group of people in the Galilee that tried to take Jesus and tried to take him and present him as king, and he refused, telling them, Mine hour has not yet come, according to John chapter 6, 15. Then one day, one specific day, we're going to find here, Jesus not only permits it, but he's about to arrange it. As he approached, verse 29, approached Bethpage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples and said, verse 30, go into the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you will find a young donkey tied there on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. Verse 31, if anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say this, the Lord needs it. So, verse 32, those who were sent left and found it just as he told them. Verse 33, as they were untying the young donkey, its owners said to them, why are you untying the donkey? Verse 34, the Lord needs it, they said. Verse 35, then they brought it to Jesus. Did you see what just happened there? Did you see? Uh, I can't believe that worked, right? <laughs> go take this guy, go just take this, this guy's donkey. Just take, you're gonna, you, he's going to walk up. He's going to look like you're stealing it. Just tell him the Lord needs it and he'll be good with it. And he actually is, right? <laughs> I, I always love to joke on this scripture that I'm going to try this uh, one of these days with the nicest car I can find out in the parking lot. <laughs> you know. What, Pastor Chad, what, what are you doing in my car? The Lord needs it. Let's see how it goes. Well, I'm sure, that, I'm sure the owner of the donkey was excited to help. Um, but there's also another, another lesson for us in this. You know, the Lord knows what he needs to accomplish his work, doesn't he? He knows that. <clears throat> Thus, if you are working for the Lord right now, if you are working for him, he knows what you need to accomplish his work. Amen? He knows. You might be thinking, Lord, I need this. I'm trying to do this for you. Lord, I need that. He knows, okay? He knows what you need, and you'll have what you need. Uh, but they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their robes on the donkey, they helped Jesus get on it. As he was going along, verse 36, they were spreading their robes on the road. 
Now when he came near the path down the Mount of Olives, 37, and the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles they had seen, verse 38, the king who comes in the name of the Lord is the blessed one. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Verse 39, some of the Pharisees from the crowd told him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, verse 40, I tell you, if they were to keep silent, the stones would cry out. How cool is that? The Pharisees really do a great job throughout the scripture of giving Jesus an opportunity to say something cool, don't they? <laughs> they really do. Matthew chapter 21, verse 6 through 10, recounts this, uh, this moment. Verse 6 reads, So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, and they laid their clothes on them, and they set him on them. Verse 8, And the great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut palm branches from the trees and spread them on the road. So clothing, palm branches, all to make way for the king of kings. And then, verse 9, the multitudes who went before, those who followed, cried out this. They cried out, you know what they cried out, don't you? Hosanna. Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna, this Greek transliteration of a Hebrew word is save, we pray. Save, we pray. It occurs six times in the Gospels as the cry of the people when the Lord entered Jerusalem as the Messiah. We see it in Matthew 21, Mark 11, John 12. The seventh and the last day of the feast that they're about to celebrate was called the Great Hosanna. And it was especially associated with the consummated salvation. Salvation is come. Salvation is complete. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest, verse 10. And when he had come into Jerusalem, this is, don't miss this, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? Who is this? So I find this interesting here because they didn't even know who he was and they're jumping on board, right? Ah, the city was moved. That word moved here uh, is uh, sio. It means to shake or to agitate, to cause to tremble, of men thrown into a tremor, to quake in fear. The whole city was moved. The multitude, it says, the mob is shaken. They're nervous. They're excited. They don't know what they are, right? They're shaken. One, th one thing that we see, uh, we'll see over the course of Jesus's last week on earth, is the power and the danger of the mob mentality. We're going to see it on full display. Uh, the Pharisees uh, feared uh, losing the mob, by the way. They feared the mob, in a sense, because they feared losing them. And we'll see their frustration in John chapter 12, verse 19. Yet the Pharisees also very successfully used and manipulated the mob as well. They feared them, but they also used them because they knew that the mob is powerful. But the mob is also dangerous because the mob is also fickle. The same multitudes that are praising Jesus will, will in four days' time, <clears throat> call for the release of Barabbas rather than Jesus. The same mob. People are often swayed by the opinions of others. They're often swayed by the power of the crowd. They want to be accepted. People want to be liked. They may compromise their values and their beliefs to fit in with the group. Have you ever witnessed that in your life before? We can be swept up by the emotional surge even of just being around uh, those people that are vocal and are excited in their outrage. You can get swept up into that. It's important for us to think with our heads, church, and not with our hearts. Remember, the heart is deceitful. 
above all else. It's deceitful. It's the center of our innermost being. And our, the center of our innermost being is still corrupted with sin and death still. And we're being renewed progressively. But as long as we're in the flesh, it's better to think with your heads and not your hearts. Uh, we've got to have courage to stand up. Stand up for what we believe in, even if it means going against the crowd. We need to be brave enough to do that. We've seen some mobs in the last couple years in our nation, haven't we? We've seen, there was one in the, we had a big mob at the state capitol just in the last several months even. Uh, remember this, wherever there is a mob, wherever there is a mob, there is a Pharisee trying to manipulate it, okay? Remember that. Don't be the mob, okay? See these stunts for what they are. John chapter 12, verse 12 through 15, uh, recounts Jesus coming into Jerusalem as a, as a king. Verse 12 reads, The next day the great crowd that had, t that had come for the festival, the festival is the Passover festival, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. Verse 13, they took palm branches Palms, by the way, were the mark of triumph to a victor king. That's what they represented. We see them again in Revelation 7, verse 9. But they took palm branches and they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, save now, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found a donkey and sat on it, as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion, see your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. This prophecy of the donkey was from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. This is why it's cool that he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. He was fulfilling prophecy that was hundreds of years old. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, Zechariah 9, 9. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Yeshua, his true name in the Hebrew. Yeshua. Jesus transliterated all the way down as Yeshua. It means in the Hebrew language, salvation. In other words, he is just and having Jesus. Salvation. Lowly. And riding on a donkey, a beast of burden he was, a colt, the foal of a donkey. He didn't come riding in on a horse with the chariot, as Diana alluded to a moment ago. He came in humility as the Messiah that would suffer to deliver his people, not from a political regime, but from death itself. That is powerful. Here he's coming, not just to be the next great political leader and to overthrow the yoke of Rome. No, he's coming to deliver his people from death itself. The Bible has two famous donkeys. Uh, there is Balaam's faithful steed. You remember him? And then there's the cult that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on during his triumphal uh, entry. And here at Life Story Church, we have Muffin, right? <laughs> Balaam's donkey was a symbol of just how far God will go to ensure that his will is done. He made the donkey talk, didn't he? That's how he'll go pretty far to make sure his will is done. Jesus' donkey, though, was a sign of the rider's identity because of is that prophecy in Zechariah. Uh, the identity, it, 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 told with, it told of who he was when they laid down their clothes, when they laid down the palm branches and he rode in on the, it was the fulfillment of that. It spoke to who he had to be. He rode a donkey now. He rode a donkey then. It will be a white horse later, church. Revelation 19 this is what we see on the surface, the dramatic entrance of our king. So that is what we celebrate. That is what we are celebrating. But is that all that we're celebrating today? We, what do we like to say around here? There is more to the story. There is 
always more to the story. The story actually starts hundreds of years earlier. It stretches from Israel all the way to the distant land of Babylon, from Jesus to Daniel, from Daniel back to Moses. If I really wanted to make you study today, we could take it from Moses back to Joseph and from Joseph all the way back to Abraham. This is quite a, quite a culmination of events here. But for, day, for today's purposes, I'm going to start here. Upon having been delivered from slavery in the land of Egypt, a, a deliverance that was the fulfillment of a prophecy that God gave Abraham 400 years of slavery in Genesis 15, 13. Upon having been delivered from slavery in the land of Egypt, the Jewish people were commanded by God to celebrate feast days. They're not Jewish feast days. They are the Lord's feast days. Exodus chapter 13, verse 6 reads, Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Verses 9 through 10 reads, It shall be as a sign to you on your hand, as a memorial between your eyes, that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. Now, the, uh, Jews, the, the Jewish people, they take this to an extreme, and they tie stuff onto their arm, and they put this box on their forehead, and they call it phylacteries. It's a sign of adherence, uh, uh, adherence to the law, right, to them, but there is a sign of adherence that is going to be imitated. It's going to be imitated by the coming world leader, the Antichrist, in years to come. The hand, the forehead. Satan is just not original whatsoever, is he? You've got to understand he's a counterfeit. So he tries to do what the Lord has done, but do it and receive glory and honor for himself. In any case, the feasts of the Lord are decreed. Keep it in your mouth, for with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. Verse 10, you shall therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. So the feasts of the Lord are decreed. Can I see this next picture? This is a menorah. We see it uh, in Jewish image, imagery a lot, not so much in Christian imagery. It is what uh, the, the candle stand, candelabra, whatever you want to call it, that was in the temple, the holy temple of God. Each one of those candlesticks was representative of one of these seven feasts that the Lord had decreed in Exodus chapter 12 and in Leviticus chapter 23. There is Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, the feast of Pentecost, and so on and so forth. Can I see the next picture? We'll see that these feasts are prophetic. They're commemorative of something that God had done previously because he didn't want his people to forget what he had done, his goodness. But he also had them celebrate them in a manner that was prophetic. So he wanted to show his people what he has done before. He'll do it again. That way you know it's him. That's his signature. His fingerprints are all over this. The first four feasts of the Lord were fulfilled. They're, they commemorate Passover, Egypt, obviously, but they were uh, prophetically fulfilled by Jesus' first coming. The Passover, he became the Passover lamb, we'll see. On leavened bread, he was in the tomb. On the feast of first fruits, he rose from the grave and was resurrected. On the feast of Pentecost... We saw the coming of the Holy Spirit, right? So I'm trying to be as brief as I can on this. You know we've done it before. We could study this for several Sundays in a row. In any case, though, the spring feasts fulfilled by Jesus, the Pentecost, the last three feasts are the fall feasts. They have yet to be fulfilled prophetically. Leviticus chapter 23, verses 1 through 2 reads, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Convocation in the Hebrew is mikra. It means something called out, a public meeting, a rehearsal. In other words, like I said, they were instructed to celebrate the feast in a way that was a rehearsal for how he would fulfill that feast later. So, Passover, for example, this is very important in regards to what we are celebrating today. Uh, it's the first one. Remember, the death angel passed over the homes marked with the lamb's blood in the deliverance from, from Egypt. While God sent plagues upon Egypt, the lamb's blood kept them safe. Remember that. 
Leviticus chapter 23, verse 4 through 5, after their deliverance, they receive instructions. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, rehearsals, which you shall proclaim at the Lord's appointed times, verse 5, on the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. It's the first one he establishes. They would ceremonially, cer- ceremonially lay, <coughs> uh, slay, excuse me, a lamb. Uh, Doves and pigeons if you were poor, but a lamb was instructed. At the time, they didn't comprehend at all that one day another lamb would be offered by God for them and for us. Commemorative of Egypt, but prophetically fulfilled by Jesus on the cross as he was crucified, by the way, on the feast of Passover. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul tells the Corinthians this to, to clear up any confusion. He tells them, Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. It's actually so important for us to understand Passover if we are truly going to understand Palm Sunday. And why is that? Because... In Exodus chapter 12, God gives Moses a prophetic instruction. A prophetic instruction instruction that, if read alone or out of its greater context, uh, it seems to have very little meaning, but we're going to put it in its context today. Sound good? All right, Exodus chapter 12, verses 3 through 6 reads, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the 10th of this month, remember that, on the 10th of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And verse 4, if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Verse 5, your lamb shall be without spot or blemish. A male of the first year, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Verse 6, now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. The 10th of Nisan church, the lamb is identified and it is presented to the priests. It is inspected by the priesthood, inspected to be sure that it truly is without blemish. Then ritually killed exactly as instructed in Leviticus and in Exodus on Passover. But remember the 10th of Nisan, what happened, the lamb is brought, the lamb is expected. So let's keep going, but let's change gears a little bit. I want you to remember that as we move to Daniel. We've mentioned how Moses was used to establish the Passover. He was used to establish the Passover in the Torah, in Exodus. God commanded him how to do it. But what about Daniel? I mentioned Daniel. What does Daniel have anything to do with what we're talking about today on Palm Sunday? Well, let's take Daniel chapter 9, verses 25 through 27. Three verses. Know, therefore, and understand this, this uh, uh, prophecy that's being given to Daniel, that from the going forth of the command, remember that, to restore and build Jerusalem until the Messiah Prince. So we've got two dates. The command is given to re- rebuild and restore Jerusalem until the Messiah comes, two fixed points in time. Keep in mind, at this time, uh, Daniel is still in Persia. The Jewish people have not dispersed yet back into the land, into Jerusalem. They have not rebuilt the city or the temple yet. He is given this prophecy. From the going forth of the command to rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the prince, there shall be, are you ready for it? Seven weeks and 62 weeks. How many weeks is that for you math majors? Yes, 69 weeks. That's how much time will be between these events. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. 
And after 62 weeks, remember the 62 came after the 7, so after 69 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. After the 69th week, but before the 70th week, in verse 24, the prophecy starts out with saying 70 weeks are decreed for you. But now we have been given a 69-week period between those two events. Are we keeping up? He'll be cut off, but not for himself. But not for himself. Cut off there, that word, is the word karat. It means execution, death penalty, or executed. In other words, the Messiah, the Savior, will be killed. He'll be executed. This is in Daniel, hundreds of years before Jesus' time. He'll be killed, he'll be executed, but not for himself. Let's keep reading. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, a dispora, until the end of the war, desolations are determined. Verse 27, then the 70th week, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abomination shall be the one who makes desolate even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. So there's a lot to unpack here. I realize that, all right? There's a lot to unpack, uh, but... For today's purposes, I just want to look back at verse 25. Can we see verse 25? There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. So let's just do the math here. Can I see that graphic that was next up? We got a total of 69 weeks. A week to the Hebrews was seven years. So if we understand that, we've got a period of time that is prophesied between these two events. Seven years times 69 is a total of 476 years, or if you really want to get specific, 1,073,000, or excuse me, 173,880 days. That's a lot of days, right? It's pretty specific if you get right down to it. Well, something happened Something happened after this prophecy was given. If we scoot forward to the year 445 BC, yes, scooting forward, to the year 445 BC, a decree was given. And it's recorded on this Cyrus cylinder, King Cyrus cylinder, recording historical events. It's on display in the London Museum On this cylinder is recorded a decree that was issued on March 14th, 445 BC. The command was issued by Artaxerxes I to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. It's interesting that we just studied uh, the story of Esther this past Wednesday night because this Artaxerxes would have been Vashti's son. So he had a soft spot in his heart, perhaps, for his Jewish stepmother. He issues a decree and issues a decree that the city be rebuilt, not just the city, but the walls as well. And this is what leads to Nehemiah's wall being rebuilt. Each person, by the way, when they were rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem, each person would that had the property on the outside wall, they would just take their yard and build that section. Everybody was responsible for building their section, building their part of the wall. And even in troublesome times, they would often have a pickaxe or shovel in one hand and a sword in the other in case marauders were to come upon them, is how the story is told. In any case, from March 14th, 445 BC, the decree is issued. So if we just do a little math, we know the exact day count, don't we? 173,880 days. Uh, let's just move forward. If we do move forward, we arrive exactly at April 6, 32 AD. Anybody want to guess what day that was? The 10th of Nisan, exactly. What happened on the 10th of Nisan? If you really want to do the math, uh, Sir Robert Anderson did the math for us in The Coming Prince. 
477 years minus one year, subtracting uh, uh, one for year zero, yada, yada, yada. He's, uh, he's the mathematician, not me. In any case, we arrive exactly at April 6, 32 AD, the 10th of Nisan. Can any, does anybody want to guess what happened on the 10th of Nisan in 32 AD? It might have something to do with Palm Sunday, right? John chapter 12, verse 12 through 19. Let's take that. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival, Passover on the 14th, making this day the 10th of Nisan, the presentation of the Lamb Day, the day the Lamb is to be presented to the priests. They heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So they what? Verse 13, they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat, at it, sat on it as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Fulfilling church. Oh my goodness. Not only Zechariah 9.9, but fulfilling the prophecy of Daniel in conjunction with the, the command that was issued to the day. I'm sorry. 66 books of the Bible, 40 different authors, they're not getting together to, to, to make this happen. They can't make this happen. This is the inspired word of God. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Amen. Save us, save now, Jesus. They were, proclaiming, they were proclaiming salvation as he rode in. It, couldn't have been, it could not have been fulfilled any better to the T. Now, were they proclaiming faith in Jesus at that moment? I think some of them were, yes. But what's even more fascinating than that is that we know that traditionally on this day, they would sing Psalm 118 as they were bringing their lambs in for inspection. What is Psalm 118? Let's read it. 24 through 26. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, in other words, Hosanna, I pray, O Lord, O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Verse 26, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. I mean, they couldn't, they're singing the prophecy of Zechariah. They're singing the prophecy that's being fulfilled to the day, going all the way back to Daniel. They are declaring Jesus to be the Mashiach Nagid, is what they're doing. The Messiah, the King, just as Daniel's prophecy was given in verse 25. This is amazing. Now, we already talked about how the festival days, they would, they would celebrate them ritually as instructed by God because the, how they would do it ritually was how he was going to fulfill it prophetically later, right? We've already established that from the scripture. This means that as Jesus is coming down the Mount of Olives, heading into the Eastern Gate, the high priests are over at the Northern Gate preparing the Passover lamb, preparing the, their, their yearly Passover lamb. They're, while they're preparing it, while the dress rehearsal for when the Messiah would come was happening, while the rehearsal's happening, the real thing over on the other side is actually happening. It's incredible. Which, by the way, the Eastern Gate was prophesied to happen in Ezekiel chapter 43 and 44, that he would come through the Eastern Gate. So he did. We see our Messiah filling multiple, multiple prof prophetic events all at once on Palm Sunday. It's amazing. Is that not amazing? Amen. Did you know that there was a prophecy given in Daniel that gave the exact day count from a decree when the Messiah would come the first time? And that we have that decree recorded and all we have to do is count? And then when we count, we arrive exactly at Palm Sunday in 32 AD and it happens to be Jesus riding into Jerusalem? Makes me think of how, uh, as we've been studying in Acts, how Peter 
how, how uh, uh, Luke records how Peter proved to them the scriptures, right? By showing them the prophecies and then showing them the fulfillments. I wonder if he used this one specifically. But, uh, man, how many, how many in here just need to shout Hosanna? Amen? Amen. Golly. It is too cool. Save us, Jesus. Uh, you know, I've, I, I can't, I think uh, it was alluded to in worship, you know, if he can do this, you know, if he can save us, if he can literally make all of human history work for him, right, to deliver salvation, eternal salvation to us, deliver us from sin and death itself, I think he can save us from addiction, right? I think he can save us from lust or fear or from sickness or yourself even, right? Oftentimes we, just, we need good saving from ourselves more than anything else, right? And he's always right on time. He is, you know what? You're here today for a reason. This is a divine appointment in your life. You are right on time. Right on time. He is always right on time. Let's finish out our passage in John 3, verse 19 here. At first, his disciples did not understand all of this. I imagine it probably would have been way over my head. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now, verse 17, the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because, verse 18, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. Verse 19, so the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Wow. And so it begins. So it begins. Holy Week begins. What began with rejoicing, with, what began with, with rejoicing, uh, this journey, it's going to, it's going to, Head now to its inevitable conclusion. What began with rejoicing is going to end with rejection. The same fickle mob. Luke 19, 41 through 44 records, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. So while the crowd is rejoicing, he is weeping. You see that? And he said, verse 42, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come, verse 43, upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. Verse 44, they will dash you to the ground and hew and the children within your walls, they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You know, as we take apart the book of Matthew, we see that the first 12 uh, chapters of Matthew are specifically Jesus appealing to the Jewish people. Once they finally reject him, he, he tells the apostles, and he turns to the Gentiles, having been rejected, the message not being received. You know, he, the Messiah was here, their Messiah was here, and they rejected him. So they didn't recognize the time of God's coming to them. Thus it was within that generation in 70 AD, 38 years after Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach in the Hebrew, spoke this prophecy 38 years later, after he spoke it and was crucified, after he was cut off, Jerusalem was besieged and brutally destroyed when Titus Vespasian, with the 5th, 10th, 12th, and 15th Roman legions, did build a Roman siege wall, an embankment, around the city, starving and slaughtering 1.5 million Jews. And they 
They then tore down the temple stone by stone. Even though their commander had told them not to destroy the temple, they did destroy the temple. They did anyway. They did so to, receive, to retrieve the gold that had melted when the Roman soldiers against orders set fire to the temple, thus leaving not one stone upon another, just as he prophesied. My, my. Why was Jerusalem destroyed in 70 AD? Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Jesus held them accountable to know the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. He'd given, he'd given it to the day, and they missed it. Destruction came to Jerusalem, but salvation, because he was cut off, because he was executed for you, because he was resurrected, salvation has come to you this morning, church. Amen? Amen? If you can see past circumstances, hard decisions, see past yourself, if you can see through it all, just see to Jesus, then salvation has come for you. Even most of the people that had days earlier declared Jesus to be king, they turned on him when it turned out that he wasn't going to save them in the manner that they had hoped. It turned out he wasn't going to be a political king. It turned out he wasn't going to overthrow the government that they didn't like. They turned on him. God doesn't always do things the way that we think he will or the way that we think he should, does he? But I can promise you, Globally, nationally, he's right on time. And if he's on time there, he's on time right in your life. Amen? God is coming to you this morning, so I implore you, recognize the time of God's coming to you. Recognize it. Amen? It's not a coincidence that you're here. What is he saying to you? Are you listening for his voice, or are you only listening for what you want to hear from him? <clears throat> Recognize it. Are you willing to let him blow your mind and work in your life and in your heart in a way you never thought he could? You didn't even know he could. Say Hosanna with me this morning, huh? Hosanna. Louder. Hosanna. Our Savior has come this morning. Save us. Save me. His promises are true, church. And he's coming again, by the way. And he's coming today, uh, coming again, I think sooner than a lot of people realize. I've built in a little extra time today. It's unusual that we would do a prophecy report on a, on a high holy day, right? But I think he's coming a little sooner than a lot of people may realize. Uh, how many of you uh, remember, well, let me do this one first. Let me do this one first. Can I see this first graphic? Did you guys see this? Tennessee Senate passes a bill to end chemtrails. But there's no such thing. Uh, this is, we should really be supporting the senators that got behind this and calling to support them, okay? And uh, making, this is, this is where the public needs to jump into action and make phone calls. You would, I know lots of uh, House members and senators, and they all tell me the same thing. You have no idea how much a voicemail makes a difference in how they lead and the decisions they make. And it goes for the governor, by the way, as well, because he'll have to sign off on it once the House gets, gets, once it gets through the House. Excuse me. In any case, do you all remember in uh, September 2022 when five red heifers were flown from the state of Texas. Uh, do you remember that? Yeah. To the land of Israel? Um, since that time, one of them has been disqualified, but the other four continue to be candidates for a red heifer sacrifice, okay? Um, most of the world, Christians included, haven't given it much more thought, but as it turns out, it may be a much bigger deal than many have thought. Can I see this next one? Hamas, uh, the spokesman for Hamas made remarks on the 100-day anniversary of the October 7th attack in Jerusalem, or in, in Israel, excuse me. And he said, it, 
this and more. He said October 7th attack was launched to stop the red heifers. Well, what in the world is that about, right? CBS News has reported that Hamas has actually admitted that the red heifers were one of the reasons that, on why they attacked Israel when they did on October 7th. When Hamas spokesperson Abu Abadai began a speech marking the 100th day of the war in Gaza, one confounding yet eye-opening proclamation escaped the headlines. Listing the motives for Palestinian militant, the Palestinian militant group's October 7th massacre in Israel, he accused the Jews of bringing red cows to the Holy Land. Well, in that case, that should launch an assault then, right? Well, you, wouldn't un you typically wouldn't understand or know why that would be a, a reason. But let me just read to you what he said. He said... We look back 100 days to remember the educated and complicit and the incapacitated among the world powers governed by the law of the jungle, reminding them of an aggression that reached its peak against our path, Al-Quds. So this is an aggression that reached its peak against our, our path, Al-Quds. Al-Quds is their name for Jerusalem. That's what they call Jerusalem. It, an aggression reached its peak against Jerusalem, Al-Quds, and against Alaska. That's the Alaska Mosque that's on the Temple Mount. Um, many have, for the Hebrew Temple to be rebuilt there, the Third Temple, that would have to go, you understand. So I'll continue. With the start of its actual temporal and spatial division and the bringing of red cows as an application of a detestable religious myth designed for aggression against the feelings of an entire nation in the heart of its Arab identity and the path of its prophet, the night journey, and ascension to heaven. Uh, so that's pretty interesting here. The bringing of the red cows is an attack against the, the Muslim Jerusalem, against the Alaska Mox somehow. Um, you, the Temple Mount to the Arabs, the Muslims, excuse me, is a, probably the, it's the third most holy site to them because uh, to them, this is the place where Muhammad uh, rode a winged donkey strange animal up into heaven, okay? So this was it, was, it was a story that was added much later after Islam was invented itself anyway. But it's a holy place for them, and that's why they had their Alaska mosques up there. So this is an attack against them, these red cows, he's saying. He went on to say, we will not tire or falter in calling all free people of the nation to rise to support their uh, Alaska mosque, and the path of their prophet, which the criminal Zionists are practically advancing towards destroying and establishing their temple. This is what we have chosen with our blood in Gaza for 100 days and for which the epic October 7th was about. It was about the red cows. Wow. Well, what we have to understand about the red cows is that uh, they were a sacrifice that was made to cleanse the nation of Israel and cleanse the land to build the temple. So the Muslim people, while the rest of the world is seeing this as nothing, the Muslim people over there, they see this truly as the first step of destroying their mosque and rebuilding the third temple on the Temple Mount. Uh, so much so, after uh, an altar, at the same time, an altar now has been constructed on the Mount of Olives. According to CBS News, again, a massive altar for the 10th red heifer sacrifice has been built in Israel, and there is tre a tremendous amount of speculation that the sacrifice could happen soon. Uh, an official ceremony must be conducted before the heifers get too old, by the way. So we learned about them being delivered to Israel last year, uh, but they have to be 
sacrifice before they get too old because they have to be three years old and no older. In other words, they can't be old enough to take the yoke, and they take the yoke when they're four years old, and now they're three years old. Um, a red heifer sacrifice would need to happen on the Mount of Olives and in a place that would have looked directly into where the temple stood. The land directly east of the Temple Mount is the Mount of Olives on the Mount of Olives where this thing has been uh, erected. It's been uh, built there by land that was purchased 12 years ago by a rabbi. Uh, concerning the, spe uh, the specifics of the land, Rabbi Mamo, who bought the land, told CBN News it had to be exactly at the front of the place that the priest that made this ceremony can see the holy of the holy place. So the clock is ticking, he says. If the heifers get too old, they will no longer qualify. During a recent public appearance, the rabbi said, Mamo said, we are very close to the third, years of the third year of these cows. Um, this is absolutely, church, all about the third temple being rebuilt. That is absolutely what this is all about. If you're going to rebuild the temple, you need to purify it. And purifying it, according to the book of Numbers, chapter 19, is a heifer, a red heifer ceremony that results in the creation of ash and water, this mixture that's created in the process. It cleanses the entire nation of Israel from ritual impurity. The ceremony required some of the blood to be sprinkled at the front of the tabernacle, the tabernacle which later then became the temple. Church, I'm just telling you, once Israel's enemies realize that a red heifer has been sacrificed, they're going to go absolutely nuts. They launched the October 7th attack on Israel because the cows just came into the land. They knew what what the Jews were up to. So this is a really big deal. Since the time of Moses, nine, only nine red heifers have been sacrificed. It's prophesied, by the way, that the tenth time it happens, the red heifer will be prepared by none other than the Messiah himself. <laughs> so in recounting this historical record in his commentary to the Mishnah, the great Maimonides ends with the enigmatic statement in his prophecy. He says, the tenth red heifer will be accomplished by the king, the Messiah. May he be revealed speedily. Amen. May it be God's will. The Temple Institute, uh, with the words of Maimonides in mind, says, even on their website, the Temple Institute that is getting everything ready for the third temple, even as we speak, they said this, uh, we cannot help but wonder and pray if there are now red heifers then for the first time since 70 AD, then is ours the area that will need them? Why would we have them if this isn't the time that we'll need them? And of course they believe that the Messiah will be there, will then thusly appear as well. So are, when are they planning on doing it then, right? It's got to be soon. Well, Shabbat Parah, which is the Sabbath of the red heifer, just so happens to take place on the Shabbat before Shabbat HaKodesh in the prepare, preparation for Passover. So the, the Sabbath of the red heifer happens before Passover. Shabbat Parah for the Hebrew year 5784 begins at sundown this Friday March 29th, 2024, and it ends at nightfall, Saturday the 30th, March 24th. This corresponds to the Sabbath of the red heifer. Church, what, that's when they're planning to do it, on Friday. I'm telling you, Friday. this Friday, this Friday. So uh, I wonder, will the Messiah join the party? <laughs> no. Keep in mind, uh, their, Messiah, uh, their Messiah will be a man. He'll not be Jesus. He'll be the Antichrist. So is their Messiah, will, will their Messiah show up for this church? I don't know. All I can tell you is uh, we're getting close. 
We are getting close. Never, I mean, for the first time, church. Hosanna, amen? amen. The Lord is coming soon. He's coming soon. I implore you, I implore you, uh, let the words of the gospel be on your tongue. Speak it far and wide. Implore all those that you know and love to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It's an exciting time to be alive, amen? amen. Hosanna! Amen. All right, with every eye closed, every head bowed, let's close today. We'll invite Brennan forward. Oh, my. He is deliberate. He is deliberate. He is right on time. There's nothing accidental. Coincidence is not kosher. He's not surprised by this day in your life. He's not surprised by what you've got going on in your life. He has orchestrated all of human history to bring you back to himself. That salvation would be available to all if you'll but recognize the time of his appeal, his coming to you. If you're here this morning, if you're here this morning, and I don't know what it is, if you're going through something, if the Holy Spirit is moving on you to lay something down, to get more serious about your walk, about your study, about your relationship with him, if he's, tell, if he's leading you to lay things down, if you need saving from anything this morning, I want you to bring that to him this morning, right now. If you need to lay anything down at his feet, just raise your hand and you put it right back down. Thank you. He's coming to you right now and he desires to be in you, to walk with you, to bring liberty to captives. It's by faith, not works, lest any man should boast. It is the gift of God that he's done this for you. And even if you're here this morning and maybe you've never surrendered your doubts or you've been running from the Lord, you've never put your faith and trust in him that he is who he says he is. He is who the word of God confirms him to be. The scriptures have proved him, as Luke has said. If you need to go from a mindset of doubt and unbelief and put your faith and trust in him, now is the perfect time. Change your mind. Make a decision to do that. If that's you here this morning, raise your hand. You can put it right back down. Thank you. And if you need to say a prayer of recommittal this morning, maybe you've wandered. You, he's never lost hold of you, by the way. He's never lost you. We're going to pray for that too. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for today. Lord, we celebrate you today. We say Hosanna. Lord Jesus, we say save us, Lord. We do so in celebration, though, because of what you did so long ago, Lord. How you were so generous to us to tell us what you were going to do before you did it even to the day, Lord. As we see the times that we're in, Lord Jesus, we see these prophetic things beginning to happen again, Lord Jesus. We, we don't fear. We don't fear because we know that you have us, Lord. You've promised us that we would not suffer your wrath, Lord Jesus. And so we know you're coming to get, get us as you've promised before wrath truly comes. Lord, receive the petitions of your people's hearts this morning, Lord. We agree with them, Father. We agree, standing before your throne in symphony and unity, Lord, and ask, be it according to your will, these things. In Jesus' name, for those that are here today that want to say a prayer of recommittal or perhaps salvation for the first time, trust in his name. Say this out loud as we all pray together with all your heart. Say, Jesus. I believe that you love me. I believe you're the Son of God. You're the Creator. I believe you died for my sin on the cross. That you paid my debt in full. I believe that you rose from the grave on the third day. 
and you've gone to prepare a place for me. I believe you're coming back to get me. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. I love you, Lord. Seal my heart. Make me new. Walk with me all the days of my life as I walk with you. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you, keep you, make his face shine upon you, go before you, follow after you. May you prosper in all you do. Go in grace and go in joy. Maranatha. Amen. We love you guys.